Aloha! What's up, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation. I'm Jay Dreamers, and as many of you know, I'm an eschatologist. I'm very interested, and I study and have studied for the past 20, 25 years, something like that, uh, the end times. Judgment Day, the end of the world, uh, creation events, things along those natures. And I started my journey in Christianity and moved on to um, studying the other religions of the world, myths, legends, and now I find myself here with all of you today. So many people have asked me, um, because I, I have brought up, you know, that I'm pretty decently versed in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it's an area that I enjoy studying, and I always enjoy studying it. The reason I don't talk about it as much as, you know, myths and legends and other things is because it's so... ah. Uh, it gets people in their feelings. <laughs> and there's a lot of strong emotions that come up because of people's belief systems and their religions and um, their indoctrination and things that they've been taught and, uh, you know, things like that. So I, I ask respectfully that we put those things aside. Um, I've already put in the chat, I, I'm asking everyone to be kind. You're free to share your perspective. You know, if you have theories or ideas or whatever. Um, but in the chat, I ask that nobody condemn anyone to hell or, you know, tell people what to believe or whatnot. Throughout this presentation, I'll be sharing with you my ideas, my thoughts, and some theories um, relating to the concept of the millennial reign. It's known as the millennial kingdom, uh, where Jesus is supposed to come back and that the saints and the believers and the good people of the of this world that follow Jesus um, would rule with Jesus for a thousand years. We're also going to tie in and talk about some of my plasma apocalypse theories as they relate to this concept. We're going to talk about um, the how time has been manipulated. Our calendar systems have been manipulated and keeping track of time has been manipulated. We'll get to we'll get towards that as well, and uh, we're we're going to start off with the Dark Ages. Very interesting time for me uh, to study. One of my favorite times, um, in you know in the last uh, in in recent times, I guess you could say. Uh, so many weird anomalies with the Dark Ages, also known as the Middle Ages. So we're going to tie in a lot of strange things. And um, feel free to chime in, too, if you'd like to, in the chat. Let me get the chat popped out, actually, real quick, so I can have your comments put on screen. Should you, should you like to join the conversation? If you type in my name, please don't just say hi or something. It's nice to see, but um, please, you know, if you want to actually be a part of the conversation, you can type in at jdreamers. That way I can really focus my time and energy on the topic. All right, one sec. I'm just getting this pulled up here. All right, let me test this out. Boom, seems to work. All right, cool. Welcome everyone in the live chat. Uh, let's see, where should I begin? We have so much to cover and so much to talk about. I think what I'd, where I'd like to begin is, uh, and I'm just throwing up this slideshow on the side. I'm actually going to do some screen sharing here in just a bit, but I just want to give sort of a general introduction and talk about the Dark Ages and why they're so strange to me, why the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages are so strange. Quite often, um, I point out and I talk about knights, medieval knights and their armor and why they were dressed this way and why they were top to bottom, just covered 
in metal and walking around in metal. And we're led to believe that that was because they were the elite of the elite of the fighters that were sent out to war. And, you know, but when you study ancient knights, that's not what you find. That's not what I find. I have not found that there was some sort of elite fighting force for fighting against other human beings. Although that may have happened later down the line, I don't believe that the knights originated for that purpose. I don't think, I don't think they started off for that reason. Um, if you look at knight's armor, it, it, it doesn't look like any type of armor that would be useful in warfare for fighting other humans especially a bunch of other humans. And I know there's people out there that are like, oh, no, I could do it. And, oh, you know, you, it's easy and this and that. But my common sense, having seen and studied and researched various forms of armor from the Middle Ages and from the Dark Ages and afterwards, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that that was for warfare, for, you know, for, for being on the front lines or anything. If anything, I have found that knights were sent on special missions, exploratory missions, to unknown realms and places. Basically, I'll be blunt, um, they were sent in hard to reach they were sent to hard to reach places, um, and especially places that had high electrical discharge or high electrical anomalous activity, terrestrial um electrical or electromagnetic discharge. And they wore metal head to toe in different forms, chain mail or plate armor or whatever it may be, as a Faraday cage, as a walking Faraday cage to protect them from electricity. First and foremost, um, I could also see maybe it being helpful when fighting otherworldly monsters, which are depicted and described all throughout the Dark Ages, all throughout the Middle Ages, we have examples in the form of bestiaries um, and other written records of strange monsters that existed during the Dark Ages and the Middle Age time frame. And there was elite fighting forces, elite fighters and hunters that were put together and commissioned by royalty to go out and search out and find these monsters and to kill them so that they could expand their territory and stuff. But ultimately, all throughout the Middle Ages and Dark Ages, these kings and queens, popes, and other versions of royalty, I have found were searching for the Holy Grail where they were searching for the fountain of youth. And they started searching for it at a certain time, at a particular time. Now, I will also say that it's very compelling for me to think about this concept. And I'll, 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 I'll bring up the Bible here in just a minute, but the concept, um, and I'm going to go over this whole torture thing too, the concept of um, Satan, the devil, or negative energy, whatever you want to look at it, or label it, or name it as, as ruling the modern world. I've seen, I see it all over the place. So it brings me comfort. It brings me a certain level of comfort to do this type of a study and this type of research to make sense of such a chaotic, upside down, and evil place in general, from my perspective, on the path that I have walked thus far. So... This actually brings me a certain level of comfort. Now, during the Middle Ages, not only did they have the knights that wore special armor that was metallic and walking Faraday cages to protect them from high levels of atmospheric electricity. The atmosphere was electrically charged um, to such a high degree that it had effects on humans and animals and plants and other things as well. And we're going to talk about some of those effects torture, right? Let's talk about the concept of torture. Why was torture so popular and so prevalent and so widely accepted throughout the dark ages and the middle ages? Let me just check my chat. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. Where's my chat? Where'd I put that thing? 
Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, I'm going to make sure my chat's up here. Why was torture so widely accepted all throughout the Dark and Middle Ages? Was it just because there was the Dark Ages? And we just chalk it up to that? When we don't see as much or as many forms of open public torture, um, in, you know, comparatively speaking, throughout the rest of history, but during the Dark Ages, it's all over the place. People were becoming creative as to the strange and maniacal forms of torturing other human beings, but not just any old human beings, specific types of human beings, human beings that were seen as being different and uncommon to such a degree that they were seen as being magical or mystical, saints, saintly, blessed by God with power or by the devil with power, depending on your perspective and which side of that polarity you're standing on. So, they were tortured, but not always killed. Actually, oftentimes, when researching um, these strange and sad stories about people being tortured, we find that often they didn't die. They did not die during the most extreme forms of incredible torture that I've ever read about that makes me blush just looking at pictures or listening to it or reading about it. Extreme forms of torture that would have put any regular person into shock and they would have died and not have made it for so long. Jesus is a prime example, the story of Jesus and his passion and being tortured in all those different ways. Um, but this was just common. There were thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of human beings who were tortured openly, publicly, and in secret for a thousand years, approximately a thousand years. And we're going to talk about that thousand years as well. So why? Why torture? Why feed uh, Christian saints to lions and stuff? Um, it's, I, I can't reason out that it's for entertainment. At least not as a good person. <laughs> like, at least not as a person that has a frequency and an energy signature that doesn't resonate with death and decay and decrepitness and morbidness and base things. So I ask, was the frequency different, the world across, as it seems to be today? Perhaps it was entertaining to the majority. That is a possibility. But I'm going to offer another possibility on why these particular individuals were not only tortured to such extreme degrees, but why they often were said to have, you know, to... to to not die. Oftentimes, their stories, especially when you look up the stories of the, the saints, the Christian saints or Catholic saints or biblical saints, when it discusses their torture that they went through, they had to employ various forms and try different things because not only would they not die, they would insult or pray for their captors and, or <laughs> like there's, there's, I mean, they would, they would make jokes while they were being tortured or some people would just be silent. Like it didn't even phase them whatsoever. And the only way to actually get the job done, the only real death penalty was decapitation in which later years we see the introduction of the guillotine. I call, I refer to this phenomenon. I believe this is a type. Okay. Um, well, let me back up. I believe in apocalypses, which are over here and separate from cataclysms. Polarity reversals and the sky itself opening up and the atmosphere depressurizing. 
And I also believe that the two can and do coincide from time to time. And it seems to me that the Dark Ages represent an energetic reversal, a shift, a polarity shift, where the frequency, the energy of the world, flipped upside down, which is why all these images, I don't resonate with that. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter. But anyways, let me get back to torture, right? It very well may be that certain people were from a location or a time which promoted regeneration at the cellular level. That they had spirit, soul, and energy so strong and magnified that today it only surfaces in comic books and fiction. But they could not die unless their head was cut off, unless their spinal cord was severed. Typically. There was exceptions and whatnot, but I, when it comes to the apocalypse, I refer to this as the time of no death, which is also referenced in the Bible. But I also believe that when we go through cataclysms, which are less severe than apocalypses, that there are areas in the world that are privy to amplification of energy. I call them places of power, right? Oftentimes caves and volcanoes and things like that. Um, in the modern, I think many people refer to ley lines and those types of things. Certain people born at certain times and in certain locations, especially during a time whenever the, 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 the atmosphere is electrically amplified, those people's spirits would be ablaze. Those people would become prophets and priests and seers and priestesses and prophets and, and, and uh, you know, whatever many other words you want to use for people that are powerful. They were seen by those who had no power or the weak souled, the weak spirited. And I don't like the term NPCs. I know people like to say that. <laughs> I don't really like that one. Um, I believe there's varying degrees of strength to the human soul. Some are born with very strong souls and some are born with weaker souls in comparison. I don't feel personally that that makes them any less or any more human. It just makes them more or less powerful. <laughs> Anyways. So, let us suppose that the atmospheric conditions in this world changed to such a degree in certain areas and at certain times that it allowed the people in those areas to adapt to it and to become a part of it so that their souls were amplified and magnified. Let us also suppose, as I talk about in my Plasma Apocalypse breakdowns, that we have terrestrial energy that right now is being sucked into the core of the earth. Therefore, all of the magic and spirit and whatnot that used to be on the surface world is all but dwindled as, it, as the earth charges and pulls that energy inward to the heart. And from time to time, we go through reversals that, you know, varying in length where that energy reverses and blasts out through those cavernous openings and places, right? These become places of power um, and beams of light shoot up into the heavens from these particular areas, but especially at the North Pole, where Mount Maru is, where I believe the quote-unquote throne of God, or the seat of God, or the footstool of God, the entrance to the inner world, traditionally, lies. The biggest, greatest opening, which allows the most energy to shoot out. And all of those who live up in that area, on that island, that used to be on our maps, they would have the strongest spirits. They would have the strongest bodies. <laughs> they would be the most intelligent and wise, or at least had the potential to be. All right. Um, man, I got off track. I just super went on a tangent there. All right, let's see what I was, what was I talking about here. 
the time of no death. Yes, so regeneration, right? So torture and cellular regeneration. Let's say that the, the atmosphere was amplified, electrically amplified, right? I don't know if you know this, but when studying um, plasma physics and medical applications of plasmas, especially cold plasmas, in the modern age, mainstream science is just barely scratching the surface of the regenerative qualities the skin and the body inherit with plasmas. They're barely even touching the surface on radiation and handling it like children playing with fire, when it is extremely powerful and a useful tool, which I will talk about in another video when we get into sacred and mythic metals and substances and minerals and things like that and radioactivity. Anyhow, I could see that these people were difficult to kill quite often. As a matter of fact, there's, there's, there's accounts of witches. They would, they would try to burn. And sometimes these witches, when they were truly witches, and they were, I mean, I don't use the word witch derogatory, okay, or wizard or any of that, right? They're just powerful spirits. What the person does with their powerful spirit makes them good or evil to me. But there were stories of people where they tried to burn these witches in the fire and the fire would separate around them. So they had to try another way. They would, um, they had developed particular tests to see if a person was a witch or not. Which seem ridiculous to, to us today because our conditions today are different. So, it doesn't make sense to us. We're not used to, and nor can we really conceive of conditions being altogether different the world across, or at least in particular places in the world. So, for example, one of these conditions, one of these tests to see if a person was a witch, was they would put them into the water, tie them up, and they would throw them into the water or lower them, you know, from a chair. And if they sank, then they were innocent and they were not witches. But if they floated, they were definitely witches. And it could be warlocks and wizards and any, in, I mean, it could be martyrs and of saints and all that stuff. Okay. But typically they just, you know, they use that one general label of witch or witch, etc. Now today that sounds retarded to us. Today that sounds dumb. You know, because if they sink, obviously, you know, th they would say they're innocent, but they would be dead and it wouldn't matter. Or if they floated, they would be guilty and then they would try to kill them anyway, right? But I believe that there's actually reason to this. And if we change our mindset about how the conditions of our world were not always the same as they are today... And that people who survive from condition to condition or survivors of cataclysms and especially the apocalypse, that they would be altogether different in a new environment. So let me give you an example. Us today, if we survive the next apocalyptic cycle where the sky opens up and the atmosphere depressurizes, our atmosphere, the world across, would be entirely different than how you're used to it right now because the pressure would be released. And when the, re and when the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, pressure of our world is released worldwide, it will change and have an effect on everything in the world, on the surface. The density of objects would lessen. And correspondingly, buoyancy would be increased. And what people perceive as gravity would be lessened, and all objects would weigh less. However, us, with our bones and our muscles and our skin and, and, and whatnot, we would remain dense. We would take our density from this world into a world that is less dense, and everything new in that world would be less dense. All, all life forms born into that world would adapt to it, and they would be less dense. You'd be like a superhero. 
you would have like similar like superpowers at least super strength and speed because of your muscles and you'd be very dense it'd be hard to beat you up and if you were more dense right and we put you in the water you would sink right but if we reverse the scenario and we have let's say that let's suppose that we together don't live in the modern world but we already live in in a time where everything was less dense but everything in the atmosphere was electrically charged and therefore it electrically charged and amplified your spirit and your soul and people had telepathic powers and abilities and telekinetic abilities and they were basically seen as magic beings but less dense let's say that they survived another apocalyptic cycle right and then they went into the next world where everything became more dense and more dense and more dense. They would be seen as witches. And when you put them into the water, they would float. They would be less dense or they, have, they would at least have the potential to float. So that's just a mind exercise so that we can wrap our heads around maybe not looking at the ancient past or what I call ancient oblivion as being full of cro magnon you know troglodyte thinking idiots that just did this had the stupidest traditions because they were uneducated no they lived in different times all right um so uh, let's see we we're talking about the middle ages the dark ages ah okay so i believe that the atmosphere was electrically charged let me go ahead on, i'm going to take these down well, actually, no. Let, let me go ahead and comment on these pictures before I take them down. Uh, let's see. I want to skip ahead to the first one here, and I'm going to go over some of these, and then I'm going to share some web pages with you. Let's start here. This is a Bible verse. It says, Truly I tell you, some are, who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in, was, in his kingdom. That's from the book of Matthew. So this is Jesus saying, Some people were there with him physically at the time would not die until he returned then in the book of mark we have the exact same thing i tell you there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see me return and in the book of luke the same thing some standing here which shall not taste death i definitely believe it's possible for your body to regenerate and to be healthy to such an extreme degree that you that living to be a hundred years and only a hundred years or less would be inconceivable it would be unheard of and as it talks about in the bible people would think that you were cursed there's a problem because most people would live far beyond a hundred years to a thousand up to a thousand that would that would be that would be normal under the right conditions, under different conditions. It says, let the groans of the prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserve those doomed to die. So this reminds me of the Christian martyrs, right? Did you know John the Baptist who wrote the book of Revelation? The rumor was that he could not die. <laughs> um, I mean, the disciples in the New Testament even talked about that themselves. That was a rumor of, of his time that John the Baptist could not die or at least would not die until a certain you know event had happened or come to pass. And the rumors say that the rulers at the time tried to kill John. They tortured him, even throwing him into a vat of boiling oil. Let me see what I got here. Hold on. I actually have something about that pulled up. Oh, here we go. It said that the Roman emperor Domitian commanded that the apostle John be boiled to death in oil. But John only continued to preach from within the pot. Another time, John was forced to drink poison. But as promised in Mark 16, 18, it did not hurt him. And so he was exiled to an island named Patmos, where he received, allegedly, his revelation from God, from Jesus. And there's other stories, too, of um, 
saints and alleged witches or powerful people who were to be killed. And while they were being tortured, some giggled, some laughed. One person was being burned, right? He was strapped down to like a grill, basically. And they turned up the heat and fire. And after a while, he, he told his captors to flip him over because he was done on that side. So not only that, but imagine an increase in oxygen in our atmosphere, right? Whenever, when these ionized beams of, of um, gas, which is oftentimes oxygen and other gases too, but um, the oxygen fills up the atmosphere. Every other cycle, every, every other shift we go through, Mother Earth refreshes our oxygen supply. And that comes up, that comes up through the Earth in the form of gas. And oftentimes that gas becomes ionized on the way up. Or electrified or activated. Man, <laughs> I'm just looking at all these pictures. Um, and anyways, oxygen is beneficial to the body. The ox oxygen helps to heal the body quickly. And the faster your body heals, the less you need your pain receptors to be even activated because your body's not worried about it. Your body already has what it needs to take care of it. So it doesn't send out the signal. Oh, problem. Attention over here. Help, help. Because you already have the help that you need. Your body's fine. Right? There was times when people, um, certain people in, in certain times could, you know, get a gash or a cut or whatnot and watch it fix itself quickly. Regeneration. Uh, let's see. Let me get back over here. Sorry if I kind of go on tangents and stuff. All right. So. Uh, so torture, right? So these people were tortured um, as a form of punishment because like it had to be bad. So imagine, right? Like spanking in the modern age, unfortunately. I'm, I, I'm not an advocate of corporal punishment for children whatsoever. I don't practice that. And I believe that, you know, it's evil. So take that however you want. Um, it's messed up. <laughs> um, but when I was a when I was a child, I was spanked with a belt. <laughs> I had a I had a grandmother on one side of the family that would make me go to the tree and pick out which branch she would hit me with. You know what I mean? Uh, but let's say in the modern age, uh, you have a parent that takes their belt off, just a regular belt, and they're gonna you know slap or swat the butt of a child or whatnot as some form of punishment or disciplinary action, which is common in the world that we live in, which. We'll come back to when I talk about Satan ruling this age. <laughs> um, that would hurt, right? But if it didn't hurt, it would, it would be no effect. It would be ill effect. It would, it would just be pointless to do that. You'd be wasting your energy while the child is sitting there laughing. That actually happened to me one time. I can, rem I can remember um, I was, I was going to be spanked and no one could find the belt, so they got a ruler. And when they hit me across my butt, the ruler snapped and I started laughing so hard and it, because it didn't hurt. I, re I, came, I, I came to a certain age where I realized, man, I was just crying because I was afraid. But it doesn't hurt. And I started laughing, um, which didn't sit well. <laughs> but anyways, that's my point, right? My point is they would have to. Um, I mean, they wouldn't have to, but I'm, I'm sure it would be reasonable to them in their modes of thought. Um, that their disciplinary action would, they'd have to step it up a notch or three notches or five notches or some spikes or whatever the case may be. Right. Also, there's other reasons for torture too, right? Like trying to get people to confess to where the other, you know, where, where do you people gather? Where's the other ones like you, et cetera. Now this brings us back to who's doing this, right? I mean, if, it, if, if think about the Christian martyrs and let's just suppose that they were good. Okay, I'm sure, uh, me personally, I feel like every form of religion has been subverted and taken over by pure evil. Okay, now I'm, that's not, don't take it personally. It's not, I'm not saying you're evil if you're, if you have a religion. I'm just saying as corporations, groups, whatever, they have been infiltrated all, all the world across from my eyes. That's what I have seen and experienced personally. And I have a lot of experience in the world of religion. Uh, where was I? I don't know. Um, so torture, right? Oh, so they would, they would try to figure out, you know, they want to get information or 
They were inquisitive, which brought about the Inquisition, right? Um, basically, there came a time, historically, when traditionally all was well. People lived and, and things were, 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 were pretty good. Or let me give you an example, like the Golden Age. Around the Middle Ages, Islam, in a particular location in the world, particular geographic location, they had a golden age, right? And um, all was well, and they were advancing, and peace was prevalent for about a thousand years, which is reminiscent of what Jesus talks about, living and reigning and ruling with him for a thousand years, the good people of the world. This is the effect that this has on us when the light of the world returns and amplifies the spirits of those people in the areas where those places of power exist. Other places would be dark, or at least dark in comparison, as far as illumination goes, and wisdom, and peace, and prosperity. All right. Um, I'm trying to think of what I was saying, um, hey, thank you so much for that donation. I appreciate it. I missed who that was. I'm sorry. All right. Um, oh, oh, yeah, the pictures. Okay, that's where I was. I have a lot to share. I have, I have so many thoughts on the subject. Let me get back here. Yeah, these are some extreme <laughs> forms of torture, right? There's the St. Catherine's wheel, the breaking wheel, etc. The I, I, I wanted to share this picture because these dudes remind me of the playing cards in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> They were clearly painting the roses red, right? <laughs> like, look at their hands, their, their, their hands stuck. Just, that also reminds me of, uh, what is that movie? What's that movie where it's like futuristic sci-fi and they have to fight the alien bugs? You know what I'm talking about? It's like uh, the war against the bugs in space or whatever. And there's this part in boot camp where the drill instructor throws the knife whoosh, and it sticks that dude's hand up there. That's what these guys are going through right now. Anyhow, where was I? Uh, these are different forms of punishment. Like I said, decapitation or the nape of the neck, right? The, the base of the brain, basically. They'd have to cut that off. And even their stories where the person's soul, their spirit was so powerful that even after the head was cut off, that didn't always do the trick right away. So, yes. Oh, the burning too. So oftentimes these saints, martyrs, witches, whatnot, they would not burn. We have stories of this in antiquity, biblically speaking, of Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, more commonly called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were put into the fire for being heretics, a massive, huge blaze, and they weren't burned, which sounds like cold plasmas, like I was talking about, which don't burn the human body. Abraham, also, in certain extra-biblical texts, there's a story where Abraham had the same thing happen to him, where he went before Nimrod, I believe it was, and Nimrod had a fire so big it was like a small city, and had Abraham thrown into it, and the guards caught on fire. But Abraham walked around, and he was fine, whistling Dixie, praying, <laughs> like... Not a problem whatsoever. So these types of things has happened, have happened. There's, there's examples of them that can be found throughout history. All right, let me just scooch through some of these. Um, so oftentimes the, the final thing was um, the noose, right? They would snap that nape of the neck. They would snap the, spi the spinal cord. Um, sometimes burning would work, but they found that it, I mean, you'd have to burn them for quite some time. Um, the guillotine, that was, that was really the end-all, be-all. Um, some of this, obviously, you know, had pub... Oh, and it was also mental torture. So if they couldn't torture them physically, right, because it didn't hurt, they would try to torture them mentally through their physical examples of torture. So messing with, you know, parts of their body that they're a little more attached to than other parts, if you catch my drift. Or locking... You know, um, may, you know, finding out if they were claustrophobic by locking masks on their faces or, 
you know, making it so that it was difficult for them to breathe. This one right here is especially heinous. The brass, the brazen bull, where they would essentially cook people. And they would scream, and their screams would echo out through the nostrils of this device. And it would sound like a bull screaming. <laughs> because it would echo. And the steam and the smoke would come out of the bull's nose, and it was quite a spectacle. It's also, um, you know, we see this in movies too. That's why I threw in The Princess Bride, right? Uh, the rack, etc. But oftentimes, you know, if a person couldn't be damaged physically... They try to terrify them. Yeah, sad. Um, this is also, you know, like you, this rack right here, they show you this in Braveheart, right? It's another example. Braveheart is a, is a really good example of this type of stuff. And it would serve as a lesson to the commoners who may not have had superpowers or extra healing abilities or whatnot, right? Look at this. I mean, look, it's, it's an evil person about to murder a good person. Like it's, I mean, the, at least that's how it's represented. This person appears to be good. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So w what would inspire so many people the world across during a particular point in time after a thousand years of prosperity in certain parts of the world at the very least what would inspire the whole world to get on board with torture and death and perversion, mutilation that continued for hundreds and hundreds of years? In the Bible, it says that Satan is the god of this world. So that brings us to Satan being bound, locked up. According to the Bible in the book of Revelation, I'll show you that in just a minute. It says that Satan was locked up and locked away in the earth, much like the, the fallen angels were locked away in Tartarus, down inside the earth, right? Now, for me, this especially helps to imagine the story if I don't think of Satan as some, you know, like, like the picture in the thumbnail that I, <laughs> that I chose from the movie Legend, right? Or some cartoonish, you know, red cherub with like a pitchfork and a pointy tail, and but an energy, a frequency. And it says that he's the god of the, the air, the airwaves, right? And are we, even right now, at the moment, as I look around my bedroom recording this for you all, and with you all, are we not surrounded and inundated and submerged? by various types of frequencies from big, long radio waves to short form microwaves all over the place. Technology and electricity are, are tools, I'll say. They have been invented out of necessity. And the necessity is that when you live... During the time of energetic amplification, I'll just call it that, you have no need of technology. You don't need a cell phone when you have telepathy and you can just focus on the person you'd like to share information or feelings or emotions or pictures with. You have no need of YouTube and television, Facebook and cell phones. <laughs> If we change the conditions, we can change our norms. And if we have thought experiments where we suppose that the conditions were changed to help to explain abnormal things in the past, we might find reason in the differences between the past and the present. All right, let's see what else we got. Oh, these coins. Okay, so this brings us to, um, let's talk about these coins real quick. I'm just going to touch on this. I'm going to come back to all this in a minute, okay? But these coins, I want to I want to kind of point this out. Not just coins, okay? Dates. Dates, especially from the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages onward, 
especially the late Middle Ages. So, you know, from a thousand onward, basically, or allegedly the year thousand onward. Dates were interesting, and I'm just going to give you the quick. Here's the quick on it. The dates were written like such. Oh, man, hold on. I've got the slideshow on. Hold on one moment. Stop the slideshow. Okay, now, the dates were written as such. Right? But many people have noticed that this is... This seems to be incorrect, but this is not the number one, but this is the letter I, which would mean this coin was not from the year 1784, but from the year 784, in the year of, or the time of, these light pillars, or Jesus, okay? This is I, also J, or Jesus, or Ishus, or Yahshua, or Yeshua, Joshua, however you pronounce it, okay? I don't, I'm, I love studying that particular topic of the name of God, the name of God's Son, etc., but that's not what this video is about, so I'm not going to go into depth on that. But that is what this represents. This letter I, this is a letter I. Look at this. That's a letter I. Clearly it says sit. <laughs> That's an I, right? Now, there's always exceptions and anomalies, and we can find, you know, different places where they appear different or whatnot. But there are so many compelling examples that I have found um, from dates that were written, especially when you go back past the 1800s. Right. Once it came to the 1800s, this letter I became commonly thought of and accepted as a number one. Now, was that pushed on to people, suggested and recommended, even though those who made the coins knew differently? Or did we just collectively become retarded and stupid and we, you know, we forgot our origins and we forgot why things are the way they are because we just accepted them at face value? Could be both. But this is an I, and it means in the year of Jesus, or in the year of the Lord, 784. Here's another example. This one's uh, allegedly a coin from 1728, but that's not it. That's not the same one, is it? Hold on. No, 1784, 1728. I mean, there's a bunch of different examples of this. And it's not just coins, it's in books, it's on maps. Quite often time, the I will be separate. It'll be a different font, it'll be larger or smaller or even spaced between the rest of the quote-unquote numbers. But around the 1800s, they just replaced the I with a 1, which by default added a thousand years to the calendars. Here's a really good example. 635. Now, oftentimes, this was, you can find examples where this was a J, right? There's, they're the same letter. J is just a capitalized fancy I, basically. Um, but you can see, like, like I mean, there's, I, I, I like words and, and letters and things of that. Okay, there's a there's a bigger space between this I and this number six than there is between the spaces between the rest of the numbers. It's set apart. It's thicker. This is bold. This is regular. Okay. That means the year 635. Or 635 years in the time of or after or in the time of the light of the world commonly called Jesus. Um, here's one more. Now, this one's, shoot, now, look at this one. I mean, I could break down the symbolism in this whole entire coin another time, I guess. But just, let's just focus on the date. That's an I. <laughs> like, I've never seen a number one in my life that looks like that. 
I mean, that's, I, that looks more like the Hebrew Gemel than it does the number one. That's not the number one. To me, I don't acknowledge that. Are there coins that have a number one? Yes. Do people get confused and things get, you know, messed up or whatever? There it is again. Yes. <clears throat> now, if that's true, that means that there have been a thousand years added to our calendar. Right? Which I believe, and I, you know, if I, if I mess anything up, you know, don't just understand I'm fallible and it's late and I make mistakes or whatever, but I believe that would make the year 1000 um, akin to like the year zero, right? So a thousand years were added. Yeah, so the, the year 1000 technically was the year zero or one or whatever you want to say. Now, that means that today, 2024, as of this video, it's, it's technically traditionally 2024 years since the light of the world appeared. That's the story we're told. But if this is true, what I just showed you, then our year is actually closer to approximately 1024. But there's more. Time has been manipulated. Our calendars have been manipulated and adjusted and messed with many times over. The thousand year marker, that's the biggest one I have come across. But there's more to the story. Thank you. I appreciate your donation. Thank you, everybody. I'm not in the chat. I'm nervous too. <laughs> I just want to just continue on with the presentation. Now, this says the phantom. Let me, let me blow this up so you can read along. Hold on one sec. There we go. Oh, that doesn't seem to work. I don't know. Anyways, I'm just going to read it. Um, this says, The Phantom Time Conspiracy Theory. I don't like that they call it that. The Phantom Time Theory claims that the time period from 614 to 911 never existed. This theory asserts that these additional 300 years, which I think technically it's 297 or something, right? We'll just round it up. An additional 300 years of history were fabricated during the Middle Ages to legitimize Otto's claim over the Holy Roman Empire. According to this theory, we should be living in the year 1726 as, you know, when this was written. So if that's true, and I'll come back to that whenever I share my screen here. If that's true, not only do we have a thousand years that have been added to the calendar, which means we need to subtract a thousand years to get closer to a true date. We need to subtract an extra 300. 1300 years supposing that this is true in addition to that there are other lesser forms too like the the 11 to 13 days that it that were just added to the calendar right they just added extra days all the time constantly manipulating what we call time no wonder we're lost no wonder no one knows what time it is or what season it is or what year it is no wonder the past is all flipped around and convoluted and upside down and people don't know when events happened and when ancient Egypt was or Greece, ancient Greece and all these times and epics. No wonder carbon dating is all screwed up. I mean, I have other reasons for carbon dating being screwed up. But anyways, let's move forward. Ah, here we go. The Phantom Time Conspiracy Theory. I'll just read this to you real quick. The Phantom Time Conspiracy Theory, this is the Wikipedia article about it, is a pseudo-historical conspiracy theory. That's garbage. That's just them saying they don't believe it or they're not convinced by it. That does not mean they're the authority for all of us. This was first asserted in 1991. It hypothesizes a conspiracy by the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III. Pope Sylvester II, and possibly the Byzantine Empire or Emperor Constantine VII. 
to fabricate the Anno Domini dating system retroactively in order to place them at the special year of A.D. 1000. In order to place them as the rulers over the year 1000. Interesting. There's that year again, right? And to rewrite history to legitimize Otto's claim to the Holy Roman Empire. These people believed that this was achieved through this alteration, misrepresentation, and forgery of documentary and physical evidence. According to this scenario, the entire Carolingian or Carolingian period, including the figure of Charlemagne, is a fabrication with a phantom time of 297 years added to the early Middle Ages. Now, I'm going to come back to that timeline when we talk about Satan's... Um, we're going to, right as soon as I'm done sharing this, we're going to talk about Satan's little season. Okay. And I'm going to do math. Watch out. <laughs> I hate math. But I'm going to do it anyway because I think you know it's interesting to me and I'm sure it'll be interesting to other people too. I just want to point this out while I'm here, right? And let's suppose, okay, you may have heard through the grapevine that there's something really weird going on with like um, um, bathrooms in, in, in olden days. I mean, even up to, until recent times, right? They say that people didn't know what to do with their waste, when if we look back further in time into far reaches into antiquity, people seem to have the technology to figure out what to do with their waste and get water and things like that too, right? So what, what they show you here is that someone circled this because they say this is a bathroom in a castle, which it may be, you know, there's, um, <laughs> um, think about a castle, hold on, castles basically come from the middle ages and the dark ages and stuff like that, right? Um, there was not, there don't seem, I, I have not found that there was adequate bathrooms throughout many of these structures, not just castles, but castles, especially, right? They're fortified cities, basically, right? Um, so here's what they say. They say, oh, well, they would sit in a little toilet that had a hole in the floor up here, and then they would just drop their number two onto the wall of the castle and then let it slide on down into hopefully a moat or allegedly into the moat. That doesn't sit well with me personally. That doesn't seem reasonable. If I had a castle, there's no way in hell. That would be, there would be a rule against that. If anyone even tried to do that, they'd be in trouble. Okay. Um, that would bring about so many sicknesses and diseases, not to mention the smell. Now, sometimes they show bathrooms that don't just drop off into the side of the castle. Sometimes they, they try to show you this picture that there was this tunnel and, you know, the waste went down and then it kind of slid down into the cesspool. Imagine the smell coming right back up in the form of gas and just filling your castle with nasty, de nah, I'm not buying it. Now, let me tell you real quick, because I don't want to forget while I'm here. My theory on this is that during the time of electrical amplification of the atmosphere and or those who were born in places of power, the world across, those who have highly energized spirit would not need to eat. They don't need to because they're already energized. That is the only reason that humans eat and put things in our face and crush them up with rocks that we call teeth <laughs> and put them into the body to be processed is because we steal the energy from other living things. And we take that energy and, and we, for a time, use it up until we run out again. And then we go get more. But I don't believe that was always the case. I believe that people who are energetically amplified to extreme degrees did not need to eat food. And therefore, they would not need to go number two. <laughs> now, if they drank water, you know, I'm sure they'd have to pee. But many of these people, I don't believe did go to the bathroom. 
I've never come across a verse in the Bible where Jesus is like, oh, guys, I, I, I'll be right back. <laughs> Ever. Okay. You know, not saying they would have to put that in the Bible, but still. Um, so. It also stands to reason that those people would not really need teeth. Right? I mean, that's, that's the main reason we have teeth, is to eat, chew things up. Um, which that, to me, harkens to certain prophetic um, visions that I believe are shown to us in our dreams and in movies where people are shown their teeth falling out. And it usually is related to the apocalypse, right? Because when the apocalypse happens, then you do have atmospheric amplification the world across. So many people will probably experience that, right? But the closer you live to places of power, the less you'll need to use the bathroom. You won't sleep, okay? Sleeping is just recharging. You're already charged up. You don't need to sleep. All right, let's skip. Let's move on. All right, now let's talk about Satan's little season. Now, not not little Caesar. <laughs> I always think of little Caesar. All right, hold on. Let me let me get that up here. Put that down here. I'm gonna share some of these web pages. I'm sorry, I'm not in the chat. Just I'll jump in the chat. If you have questions or you want to talk with me or whatever, I'll, I'm happy to hang out in the chat once I'm done, kind of like presenting. Oh, where was I here? Ah, here we go. All right, so we're going to the book of Revelation. Chapter 20 specifically. The entire book is a favorite of mine. And I have many theories and ideas about all of it. Much of it, I should say. Uh, Satan is bound for a thousand years. So if Satan is bound for a thousand years, then inversely, that means that the good guys, Jesus, right? That this is his millennial rule. This is the time when the good guys win and things, you know, the, the enlightenment comes, true enlightenment. Now, keep in mind, there's always a reciprocal inverted evil version of things or a reciprocal inverted good version. It all depends, you know, on your, your path that you're on, if it's good or evil, how you perceive it. Let's read this. Satan bound for a thousand years. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. And a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years inside of a bottomless pit in the actual earth. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and he shut him up and he put a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now this translation says a little while. Some say a short season. I'm going to come back. I'm going to, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the actual Greek words. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do I want to continue reading this? Okay, then it talks about resurrection. I'm just going to summarize the rest of this next paragraph. It talks about resurrection and the resurrection of the dead. And people living and reigning with Jesus, or with Christ, it says, for a thousand years. That they would not die for a thousand years. That their bodies would be different bodies. Similar looking, but altogether different. Just like how we've been discussing now, let's get back to this Satan being released back into the world, right? So let's assume, right, that the Dark Ages were actually not so dark, that that's an inversion. Let's speculate for a moment, okay? And let's correspond the Dark Ages and... um. The, especially the Islamic Golden Age, right? With a thousand year period, approximately, right? Keep in mind, time's all scattered and messed up, but approximately a thousand year period where things were good, right? There were saints and Jesus came back and there was good people, the world across, and there was powerful people that had abilities, apparently. And people were learning and advancing 
and prospering in many parts of the world, or at least in certain parts of the world. And then suddenly, after a thousand years, the entire world's frequency changes. And all of the people who were affected by that frequency change, which I call plasma possession, look over at all the people who prospered. And a flame lit up in their eyes and their teeth pressed together. And a jealousy and a hatred like never before rose up collectively the world across. Satan was released. Now for how long? Let's, let's examine this particular verse that says for a little while or a short season. Now, this is, I'm going to go to what's called the interlinear, interlinear version of the Bible, where it shows you the original language right along with the transliteration or the translation of it, right? Now I'm going to go down here. We're at Revelation 20, right? And if we scroll down to the bottom here, you can see... Hold up. Did I mess it up? Ah, here we go. All right, cool. Man, I don't know if I want to like that. Hold on. Ah, perfect. Okay, so this, we're going to focus on uh, these three words right here. Okay? Now, it says, um, it's talking about Satan to be released for a short season, for a little while, etc. This translation says, I'll read the whole thing real quick. He cast him into the abyss and shut and sealed over him so that not he should deceive any longer the nations until were completed the thousand years after these things. It is necessary for to be released him for a little time. Now it sounds choppy and weird because it is choppy and weird, but it's the literal actual translation of it, right? We're going to focus on the last part. That's, that's what we just read, which is this part that says, for a little while, or a little season, a short season. In the Greek, in the original Greek, it is auton mikron chronon. Let's look it up. Now, they translated it as, it's necessary to be released him for a little time. Let's check it out. Auton. We click on that word. We scroll down and we go right up here to where it says Strong's Greek 846. That's, that's where we can find the actual uh, definitions and what that word conveys. Dang, hold on. I'm going to make this. There we go. Oh, okay, cool. Now, auton comes from autos. Just like our autos or auto or the word auto. And it can mean self it can mean he she or it in a third person pronoun but it also can mean the same and here you can see different versions of spellings right autos auton and auto let's scroll down a bit now you see all of these different instances followed by numbers right these are the different times that they're translated as these, or, you know, they were translated as people thought they meant this, because one word can mean different things. Uh, let's see, where was I looking for? Oh, here we go. Same things. Same. See right there where it says the same? So, basically, in addition to him, this word auton or autos can also mean similar. And often does mean similar. Auto. Like automaton means like a, a similar looking humanoid, typically. Or robot or whatever, right? It's similar. That's what, the, that's what the actual word means. So let's go back and double check it, but let's plug in similar. After this, uh, after the thousand years, after Jesus's or Christ's thousand years, after that, it's necessary for him, Satan, 
or it is necessary. Uh, let me go back. Basically, it's talking about the devil, right? It's necessary for to be released, auton or similar, right? Just cover that one up. Similar to be released, it's similar. Uh, micros, which means a little bit or small, and then chronon, which is also the word chronos, which means time. So how I translate this is for a similar amount of time, or for a similar small short time, which is a thousand years, which is like a day to God, as the Bible describes. So if that translation holds any merit, then we could expect Satan's short season, or his little time, as described here in Revelation 20, to be for equally a thousand years, approximately, right? Now, this is interesting, too. Let's read what happens after Satan's thousand years. Let's just, I'm just going to go with saying that, you know, it seems reasonable to me that it may be a thousand years for Satan as well. And, I'll, and we're going to suppose on that in a bit more, too. Now, we, we continue on reading. Satanic rebellion crushed. Now, when the thousand years have expired. Now, keep in mind, we've had 1,300 possible years added to our calendar. Right? So, we're going to do some math here in a bit. Now, when Satan's thousand years now let's talk about the beginning right when when his when when his thousand years begin we should be able to see things happening worldwide where they shift drastically and suddenly towards the negative wouldn't you think if all of a sudden satan was the the evilest entity in all religions and belief systems and myths and legends was suddenly loosed upon the entire earth i believe we should definitely see some changes in our history, in the historic record. Bad ones. Not good things, right? And we should see those promptly. <laughs> like, pretty suddenly. <clears throat> and those changes would last for a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. That's an interesting way of saying that. The four corners of the earth represent the North Pole, as we've talked about many times. Gog and Magog. Now, I also want to just skrr, put the brakes on and remind everyone, Mount Maru and the land at the North Pole alternates between being seen as an evil place and the throne of evil and a good place, a paradise and the throne of God. It depends on which cycle we're in. Because that's the antenna that puts out the frequency for the rest of the world. All right, so Satan will be released at the end of his, or I'm sorry, when the thousand years have ended, Satan will be released from his prison. Oh, well, that's why that's when the thousand years of Jesus have ended, right? Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So many people gathered together for battle. This is a world war, but a world war with so many people that it's, it's hard to even count them all. Now, let's ask ourselves, do we allegedly have a population that sounds kind of like that in, to, in the modern world? Yeah, I could see a correlation. They went up on the breadth. Now, this is Armageddon, basically. Okay. They went up on the breadth of the earth, which is also a reference to the North Pole. And surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. The beloved city is at the heart of the earth. And it always is and it always will be. At the center, at the middle. That's where all the energy comes from. So that's, like I said, that's paradise. So that's the camp of the believers. It's the camp of the chosen. It's the camp of the survivors. It's the camp of, you know, utopia. Every other cycle, at least. Now, the world's armies. Let me just, hold up. I got to pull up Mercator's map. Because I want to show you this on an actual map. 
Let's go with a boom. There we are. Make it a little smaller. Okay, so th this is this is the seat of God. This is the throne of God, etc. And, and I'm speaking from my perspective. Okay, I'm just I'll speak as a matter of fact to save us time. This is the the peaceful city. Okay, this is the Garden of Eden. This is Jerusalem, etc. Now within this area, there are many provinces, and you know state type places and, and whatnot. But in general, there's like four countries, okay, at the center of the world, which are four separate islands, which together they're one gigantic island in a circular fashion, crossed by four rivers. And they are surrounded by the southern lands. Anything apart from here is south. Anything apart from boom here, like you're that's all south. Okay. And you have to imagine that the modern age, the modern time, this, this, this island is not there. It's not depicted, at least, on our modern maps. But it seems that the prophecies of things, well, the prophecy of things that are to happen reflect the things that have already happened in the past. Or as it says in the Bible, there's nothing new under the sun. This island was once surrounded by the armies of the rest of the world, who all flocked together towards it for some reason. They all went towards the Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle became of great importance in times past. And people went there, right? I mean, I could, I could think of many different reasons why the rest of the world would find so much value in going to the Arctic Circle and wanting to claim that land, which is what we do in this satanic modern age that we live in, claiming land in the name of the queen or name of the president or whatever. As a matter of fact, the United States just um, extended their boundaries or borders way out into the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> um, and Russia is not too happy about that, right? So they will all gather together in a big world war at the center, at the meeting place, at the closest place between all of them surrounding this area, but they will all be destroyed. Now, many people have asked me, why don't we just go? If that's paradise, why don't we just go? Let's go now. Let's go now. And I now know it's not the time to go yet. And I'll show you why. And I'll tell you why. And whenever I thought about this, I'm like, man, I already knew this before. <laughs> like, um, there will be a destruction in this area. Okay. This is the hill of Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo, however you want to say it. This is Armageddon. All of the nations of the world come to this area surrounding the good people here, right? If there are good people there. Now, let me, let's read what it says in the Bible. When, this, when the nations surround the holy city. And I'm saying, for me, I'm pretty solid. This is the holy city. This represents the Jerusalem. This represents the original Asia and India and Africa and, uh, you know, the, 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 all of our place names are renamed from here. All the rivers renamed from here. This is the Euphrates. Boom. Let me show you the Euphrates real quick. Let me show you what I mean. The Euphrates in the Bible says it's split into seven heads. Here we have a river split into seven heads that meets all of the different, this whole island meets the criteria of the Garden of Eden. This is the Tigris. Fastest river. This is Mesopotamia, or the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's definitely what this this chunk, this quadrant, is Mesopotamia originally, right? I mean, they're all a form of Mesopotamia, really. But this one definitely is the original, quintessential, first Mesopotamia. Not way out in the Middle East somewhere between two rivers. Those were renamed in honor of these places. When the people from here were forced out of here during a diaspora and circled around the world, settling in places and renaming those places after their original place. All right. Where was I? Oh, here we go. So they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven 
and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into a lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And, th and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I really want to just focus on this part. After they surround and encircle the heavenly city, because they, I doubt they'll be able to get inside of it, um, fire came down from God out of heaven. So fire from the sky up above came down and devoured them. So let me take you to a prior video that I've done. This one's called The Destroyer. I've, I've got, you know, I've talked about this subject a few different times, but this one's my favorite one. Okay. And it, I'm going to, I'm going to play this for you. Let me see. Uh, let me just, I'm just going to play this. So pay attention because what happens is the sun in our sky is getting hotter right now and it's going through a color spectrum shift. It's turning blue. And when it turns blue, it will burn the land. Daytime will not be something you can be out and be outside because you'll, you can die. The daytime can kill you. It will get that hot and it will set things on fire. The sun is going to one day transgress the, the Northern Tropic. Okay. Which is its boundary where it typically bounces off of and sort of swings back to the Southern Tropic. Right. And that gives us the seasons, but the ancients knew there would be two cycles, one where it transgresses the Southern Tropic and it gets bigger and colder and it gets further and further away until it disappears. The other one is whenever it transgresses the Northern Tropic and it gets smaller and hotter and it makes its way to the North Pole. Watch. Tropic of Cancer. As it circles its way, it doesn't stop. So remember, the winter apocalypse, people expect that they watch the sun to see if it stopped at this point and came back or if it continued on until it would disappear, right? This is the opposite one. This is the summertime one, where instead of transgressing this tropic uh, boundary, it, it transgresses the tropic of cancer, and it continuously spirals going, going around, the days getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and burning the earth as it spirals inward, creating a path to Oz, or creating a path to the old land at the North Pole, to the seat of God, etc., to Mount Maru, where it will eventually settle, right? Okay, I'll, I'll pick it up from here, past self. <laughs> now, when it settles, okay, so just to recap, the sun turns blue, right? Daytime itself becomes more and more focused, which is why the moon looks like it's shrinking and getting smaller and smaller, and the sun also is getting smaller but hotter, okay? The stars are getting brighter. It's all happening right now from, my, from what I can tell. Um, and whenever daytime is no longer spread out, but it's a straight line, right? When you understand an alternative cosmology and, and what causes the sun and the moon and stars and things like that, right? It will actually go from being a blue circle of light up in the sky to being a black dot surrounded by a blue ring, which will be daytime in a ring. That ring will settle over this island. Right around the edges right here. Now notice that there's just happens to be a ring of tall, lofty mountains all the way around acting as a wall to the Garden of Eden, right? So all those nations gathered around this island in a circle will be burned to a crisp. And if you go now, it's not, the odds are not good that, you know, this, the odds are pretty good that that will also happen to you. So you need to wait. These waters will be removed, okay? The Arctic Ocean, as it's called, which is just the deluge towards the north, will be removed one day, just like the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea and the parting of it and the waters floating up into the sky. When atmospheric depressurization kicks in and the firmament breaks open, these waters will float up into the sky, allowing you passage. Whew, man. <laughs> I love, I love all this. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Let me continue on here. I forgot where we were. So we're talking about Satan's little season about him being released for a time. Uh, this is just an article about John the Baptist being tortured, etc. Oh, here we go. So this is interesting too. Direct electrical current. 
used to preferentially, preferentially inhibit pain transmitting neurons. Now, what that means in layman's terms is that electrical current, ambient electrical currents in the atmosphere can have an effect on the human body so that you don't feel pain, which is actually said later on in, actually, I think it says it. Hold on. Let me, I still have that passage up here. Uh, let's see. Where does it say that? The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, blah, blah, blah. Like a fire. Well, where is it? Well, somewhere in here in this section, it says that pain would be eradicated. That people would not feel pain. At least the people in New Jerusalem. The people in that area. The people in that city. Where everything's... The atmosphere is extremely electrically amplified. Ambiently. It's not like you're being electrocuted everywhere you go. Okay, but your soul is amplified. Your body also. Which means you won't feel pain. There's many other things that happen to you. Um, let me see. So I believe that this is a form of what happened in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, during this time that the electrical current reversed, causing, you know, a form of cataclysms in certain areas, but also had a very beneficial effect to, to certain people that lived near these places of power where good energy from within the earth would erupt and come up out of caves and stuff like that, right? Um which meant that they would feel no pain and be able to laugh at torture and sing in the fire and, and the other things that we've already discussed, right? All right. I think that's about all I had for that. All right, let me see what else we got here. Um, so when was the Islamic Golden Age? So let's take a look at some numbers, right? And these are probably not even the correct numbers at all. Now, in the modern, we would say 622 A.D. to 1258, right? But if we take into consideration the thousand years that were added, then we would have to actually subtract a thousand years from this. But anyways, this is the Islamic Golden Age. And if we ask, so let's just focus on the end of it, when Satan is released. He would be released at the end. That would be his entrance. His grand entrance would be at the end of whatever golden age existed, whether it be Islamic or European or African or whatever, South American, you know what I mean? So 1258, let's see if we can get close here. Um, dates of the Dark Ages. So remember 1258, that's what it was, I think, right? Okay, so between 500 and 1,000, the Dark Ages occurred between 500 AD or CE, whatever, and 1,000, or 500 to 1,500. So that's, they're both within the same time frame, the Dark Ages, right? And the Golden Age of Islam. Now, let's, uh, let's ask it about another significant event in history that was pretty evil appearance, right? Date of the Black Plague, 1346, the beginning, officially, right? You can kind of probably play with these dates because our times are all messed up, but that's right at the end or the beginning of Satan's being loosed for a season. All of a sudden, the world goes through plagues that last for hundreds of years, Black Plague, right? So, let's play with history. Let's play with some math and some numbers. Whew, boy. Let me get a calculator. All right, I got a calculator here. Where were we here? Right there. All right, let me bring... I'm going to scooch the calculator over here closer. Where we were. All right, so we're going to go the beginning of the Black Plague. Let's just suppose that that's when Satan was released. Boom, jumps out of the... Tartarus from the inner earth or whatnot. Sicknesses start, right? The world across. Now, in the reverse, academically, they will start saying that, oh, we're coming out of the dark ages and the 
you know, the time, the, the evil times and the bad times and stuff. <clears throat> and now we're headed into enlightenment. <laughs> it's all flipped upside down because the priests of Satan or the devil or evil, right? Which made their way into all of your religious systems and stuff, flipped it all upside down. So let's take 1346 as, you know, a tentative starting date for the release of Satan, right? All right, so I'm going to do 1346. Let's subtract minus 1,000 years equals 346. But according to what we read earlier, right, which was the uh, phantom time conspiracy, we have to subtract another 297 years. So minus 297 for pow. That takes us to 49. Now we have to, in order to get today's date, we take 49 and we have to add that fake thousand years back onto it, right? Or no, we're in, we're in 2024. Ah, see, I get, I get mixed up with math so easily. Um, ah, let me see if I could do it. Hold on. It's in my head. I did this earlier. <laughs> All right. What was the date we're looking at? 1346. Calculator. Boom. All right. So we have 1346, which was really 346. So we minus 1,000, right? Uh, maybe I should start with today's year. Yeah, let's start with today's year. Let's try that. So 2024, 2024. I'm just experimenting right now. I hate math. Uh, let's see. 2024 minus a thousand for the false thousand years equals 1024. Okay. Um, and then minus, no, this isn't right. Damn it, I'm, now I'm getting confused again. Well, it, it, I'll just, I'll save you the time of me messing the math up. Basically, when I did the calculation, I came to the end of Satan's thousand year reign if it started back during the, the, the Black Plague um, to somewhere between today's date and, you know, approximately the year 2050, you know, give or take. So... But the point is, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be exact or whatever. The point is, if that's true, and if it also is true, if we suppose that Satan's short time is a thousand years, then this would be coming up on the end of that time, where Satan would be done away with once more, which means we should expect a polarity reversal sometime soon. You know what I mean? Now, how soon? I don't know. But, you know, for that... Tune in on, on Tuesdays when we do my Omens segment on my channel. Now, I, I put this up here just to remind myself of the Voynich Manuscript. This came out during the Dark Ages, right? This weird, strange manuscript with all these odd writings and pictures that seem alien to us. What if they came from... It's a book. What if it came from somebody that was from the North Pole? Right now, around the same time, people were looking for, like we said, um, the Fountain of Youth, the Holy Grail. This is where the Arthurian legends started, right? And this is really whenever people were trying to expand their empire. Um, well, it was that was the guys. The reality was they were looking, they were lost. Okay, because when you go through polarity shifts and stuff, it affects the mind, it affects your intellect, your thinking. Uh, left-handed, right-handed, everything flips around backwards and it affects our seasons, it affects our directions, it affects the compasses and uh, people become disoriented. They become lost and they wander about and they forget where home is. So the nobility sends out all these little excursions and expeditions across the world looking for the fountain of youth because they forgot where it is, they don't know where it is, They've, they're disoriented. And it's under the guise of just expanding territory or trying to get some spices. <laughs> like, why would you eat? No, I don't believe the whole spice story. I don't believe the Germans during World War II went to Antarctica, f you know, to increase their supply of butter, which is actual real story that we're told. Anyways, um, so the Voynich manuscript came out right around the same time. 
interesting correlation. And then we also, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the architecture, right? The architecture of the Middle Ages. Castles. Ramparts. Which I believe were to protect from monsters. Not just humans. Not just armies or whatever, you know. But monsters that walked the world, the realm. The nobility wanted protection against Phantazoids is what I call them, okay? But you can call them monsters. They would appear monstrous and scary because you don't know what they are, basically. But they're gigantic and they're monstrous. And um, I'll come back to the monsters here in a bit. But we also have cathedrals or buildings that were built on top of places of power. Cavernous systems, which allowed that vril, that inner earth energy, that good energy... Uh, the ionized oxygen to come up and they would put vents on the floor and they would bury their dead underneath this building in these catacombs where the earth would be expected to raise the dead one day in that particular location. And they would, and they would close up these buildings. They wouldn't put a lot of windows on them. They would put vents, but not windows, right? And then they would line the walls with huge pipes and they would, tune the frequency that was in the air and therefore tune the frequency, the resonant energy of the individuals inside, right? In the olden days, long ago, the individuals inside were the gods who tried to come up with as many ways as they could to retain their immortality. Because once they came down into this world and the firmament sealed back up, and the pressure started to increase, and the oxygen supply started to dwindle, depending on which time they came in, um, they would lose their immortality. They would start to age, and they didn't like that. So they used their technology, frequency, cymatics, and other things, to improve their lifespans, lengthen their lifespans. They would tune their own spirits and souls. And these would be places of healing for humans, right? Eventually, humans adopted this technology and, you know, took it over when the quote-unquote gods left. That's why these are the temples of gods. These are the actual houses of gods that were built by the humans who volunteered to exchange their building, their, their ability to build, right, to do hard work, manual labor, for technical, te technologically advanced beings or spiritually advanced beings, giants, that's why these typically had gigantic doors and halls. You look how massive the roof is. And I'm sure I could pull up a million pictures of giant doors and steps and archways and stuff. These, are, these originally were built for giants. But those giants left. And the ones that stayed diminished in size. But the buildings did not. They remained the same. But anyways, they, they tuned the frequency in, inside of these during the times when the energy came up out of the earth. Nowadays, it's just an echoey, empty place because it's not useful because there is no energy pouring into that building any longer, right? When they needed to vent and let some of the energy out or whatever, like they would just open up these tiny little, you know, cracks in the windows or whatever, but it was, it was, there was no windows and stuff. They wanted to keep all that energy that came up from below in the building, right? To heal. Now, also, you check out all the pointies. See all the pointies on the buildings? They call this a gothic style. Goat. Goat. Also, god. Gothic means godish or godlike. Because this was the house of the gods. <laughs> um, however, the pointies, when you see the pointies, steeples obelisks and things of that nature that was to keep electricity away from this building okay uh, uh, atmospheric electricity from above okay they did not they did not want it coming down from above to be struck and destroyed by the thunderbolts of the gods so you got all these little pointies right inversely I like these castles. They're so cool looking. I like them. Anyways, um, inversely, we have domes. Like my dome. We have domes. If you study 
electricity you you would you will find but if you have a conductor that's in the shape of a dome it pulls electricity towards it it's the opposite with the spires but these were designed to attract power from above and electricity from above and that's why they were made from materials that are conductive sometimes you would see a combination of both right so that they could really force uh, the energy to go where they wanted it to and quite often times you'll see some sort of aqueduct right out in front and stuff underneath all of this too which i believe that this is all has to there's underground capacitors that store the electricity so they had free energy sucking it right out of the sky because it was everywhere in the sky and tesla knew this and tesla created all sorts of interesting inventions and proved to people that you could just you don't have to pay for electricity you could just take it from the earth and from the sky but even more so during times of atmospheric electrical ampl amplification right anyways um these were the types of buildings that were built during the dark ages right and you can see the architecture change as the atmosphere changed the architecture served a purpose it was useful not just pretty <laughs> it was it had it was it had practical uses the shapes were designed to work with the flow of energy in and around and under the building hands down now today we're just like oh it's art you know it's beautiful this and that because we're not thinking about the changes of conditions or the difference in 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 conditions during the times that they were built we 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 project our conditions of the modern day upon the past and therefore we lose ourselves and we don't understand what the purpose was and we have to guess you know what i mean uh so that's the architecture so i've just kind of touched on that let's see what else we got here oh the knights let's get back to that right now they're all wearing metal right all me all metallic the chain mail especially right um especially when they're on horses and stuff too like that that builds up a lot of static charge static electricity in the air and you can i mean you think about when you walk on the carpet and then you go touch the do doorknob and you get like a little shock imagine doing that whenever the atmosphere is electrically amplified and you're on some sort of object like a horse or you know motorcycle or whatever and you're building up a static charge all the way around you you're going to want those spikes on your gear you're going to want to wear leather or metal or you know what i mean stuff to keep the electricity from shocking you basically so there's the knights the samurai are very similar in other parts of the world at the exact same time right the samurai would actually fight phantasoids they were monster hunters which these also became monster hunters people would you know i mean there's different there's different types of armor for monster hunters but let me get to the monsters let me show you the monsters I'm just going to call them monsters because I know there's probably a lot of people that are going to watch this that are not used to my unique vocabulary, but I call them phantasoids, right? These are images, just examples of monsters, phantasoids, otherworldly creatures, and creatures that were affected by gigantism in our world, modern creatures that grew to gigantic sizes that were seen, including the mutants, the humanoid mutants, like this Blimmy example, I, I definitely want to include these guys. All of them. There are legendary classes of humans that were put onto uh, the maps, on ancient maps. And they said, there's weird tribes of humans that are, they're, they're mutants. They're mutated, right? Because of what's happening and because of radioactivity in certain areas and, and other things. They're, they mutated. Their bodies quickly changed and were affected by electricity and frequency. Um, but anyways, let's focus on like the, the animal types, right? Um, and sometimes there was a crossbreed between the both of them where they appeared to you know, be animal and human. Not saying that that's what they were, but they were still mutants. But anyways, so we have all of these beasts 
Fantastic Beasts, which is where this, that movie comes from. All of these monsters that were seen, that people experienced so often that they wrote them down. Let me show you an example. Wait a minute, what's this one? Hold on. Nah, I don't want to see that one. Um, where's the unicorn? There's, that should be at the top. The unicorn existed. Oh, here we go. Boom. There's many depictions. Here's, here's, a, here's a bunch, really. I like this one, though. All right, let me bring this up. I want to show you how evil came to power, okay? The unicorn, which if we only go by our fantasy and our fiction, our, our breadcrumbs that we have left ourselves seem to indicate that the unicorn was a majestic, peaceful, powerful, good-natured animal. Just if we only went off of fiction alone, okay? Back in history, they were known to use that big old horn to spear evil people, bad people. <laughs> so guess what the bad people saw the unicorn as? Bad, right? So they would take a virgin, a pure... Now that I think about it, let me switch the picture. Hold on. Where's that other picture? Yes, that's the clothed picture. That's what we want there. So we, they would take a virgin, right? Somebody who was pure of heart. A woman, a young woman typically, um, a young maiden. And they would sit her out in the area where they were known to frequent unicorns and other mythic animals and legendary animals, fantazoids, right? Um, depending on the animal's frequency, it would be attracted to similar energy. So if it was bad, it would be attracted to bad, right? If it was good, it was attracted to good. Like attracts like. The unicorn was attracted to purity and innocence, etc. So they would have someone who was pure and innocent sit out in these areas while these two evil pieces would sneak up on it and murder it and kill it. And this is depicted time and time again throughout all of these ancient bestiaries. Hey, thank you so much for your support. I super appreciate you. Um, so these are the ancient bestiaries, monsters. That existed and are depicted. Now, are they all unknown monsters? No. Some, like this right here. Some people would point this out and be like, oh, that's just a lion. Where is it? It's just a lion. That's not a monster. Yeah, it is. It's a big freaking cat. It's a gigantic cat. Need I remind you? Like, we, yes, we, we need to be reminded of these things. The ocean is the flood. Lions are giant cats, like your house cat, but a giant one, right? We have forgotten these because we've become accustomed to them. Look like at this giant asparagus tree looking deal. All right, anyways, let's move forward. Um, so during the Middle Ages, knights dressed up in special armor would go on these missions to eradicate the countryside of these strange beasts that had strange powers and stuff. Uh, oh, and there's ones in the ocean too, by the way. The ocean ones are really interesting. They show up all the time on maps and things, and it wasn't decorative. It was not artistic. It was a warning. It was history being written on the map when people sat on the backs and got rides from whales and sea monsters, you know, and deadly sea monsters in certain areas, right? They didn't just throw that stuff on haphazardly on maps just to fill in some space and to make it look cool. Monsters existed, and they especially existed during this time. However, when Satan was released to begin his little season, one of the first things he did was go and murder all of these creatures, especially the ones that could sense evil especially the ones that could sense evil. They were eradicated. So were the people. The people were all gathered up. And um, some of these old houses from this architecture, now that I think about the architecture, right? If you're Satan and you've been bound in the depths of the earth for a thousand years 
And now it's your time to rule, your time to shine. You come out and you're all about death and destruction and thievery, etc., right? Sicknesses, the plague. Um, you're going to kill all of those animals that have spirit that are spiritually amplified, all the people that are spiritually amplified, who have telepathy, that can see your auras, that can tell if you're a bad person or not. And for the humans, right? I mean, they could they can't. People would, some people might start suspecting things, right? <laughs> like if it just happens forever. Anyways, after a while, um, when they scare enough people and all of these gifted humans go into hiding, right? They can't find them all or whatever. They start incentivizing others to tell on them, right? And to give out their locations and stuff. Or even worse, they start casting spells on the general population, knowing that those spells would find their way. I'm trying to think of uh, how to say this in words. Those spells, which are commands, which are commercials and, you know, TV and uh, advertisements and uh, the educational system and all sorts of things are a form of spellcraft. Those spells would make their ways into the hiding places where the gifted were. And they would have the gifted question themselves and question their sanity. And then if, and then, then, and then they would provide the answer for those who are questioning their sanity or others who question their sanity. And they would build asylums. Let's check out some asylums real quick. Uh, insane asylums. Oh, this is like, Architecture. I want to see architecture. Now, if you ever seen, I mean, you know, the Wizard of Oz is, is reflects what we're talking about, but the sequel, Return to Oz, includes and starts off with the asylums. Anyways, these are the different asylums. There's many different asylums. They would they would go find these gifted people. They would kidnap them. They would take them. They would trick them into coming to getting getting help which included electroshock therapy to wipe their memories and lobotomies to turn them into zombies and make them ill effective. Um, they would make it so that they couldn't procreate or have children, which is where the chastity belts came into play. And they would lock up the gifted basically. And then we would have all these children just left over, right? So there was a lot of orphans, right? After when they when just they decided to stop killing people and they used spells instead, they had to deal with the residual, which was all these children. What do we do with all these children, right? So there's a lot of orphans that just came out of nowhere in the last few hundred years, and orphans used to be a really big deal, um, to the point where you know I'm sure a lot of people have run into like the orphan trains and. It's it's almost like every movie that I watch, it's like the main character is almost always an orphan. And the movies also, I do truth in movies, and the movies reflect prophecy to us. They reflect hidden history and what I call ancient oblivion. Anyways, let's move on. All right, talked about the knights, talked about beasts of old, uh, all the torture devices, right? And mental torture, mental anguish, emotional torture. Um... I mean, if they couldn't hurt you physically, but they could hurt, you know, somebody that had a weaker spirit that you're, that you're friends with or a family member or something, that's also shown to us in the movies that that was another method of torture. They would just torture somebody else that you care about and break your heart. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? Oh, yeah. So this is Satan's time. He becomes, this is when Krampus comes to play, comes into play, the goat worshiping, all of the celebrations of Satan being released and unbound into this world. And if it's true, and if, if, you know, if I'm even anywhere near close in these estimates and theories that I've shared with you tonight, um, then I would assume that the people who worship that entity would be on high panic mode if we're close. Right? Or the closer we get, naturally, they would become more paranoid and they would not want to lose their power and they would start setting up things to ensure that they try to keep their power. 
But it's futile. It's futile. It's of no consequence because no matter what they do, the energy will flip once more. And the saving energy will return. The restoring energy will return. The king will return. I don't know how else to describe that. Um, this is chat GPT. I like to bounce ideas off of it from time to time. This is artificial intelligence. Uh, the, er the era that saw the most witch hunts was the 16th and 17th centuries, right? So right around the same time you had the witch hunts and stuff. Um, when they're being eradicated, people that had power, people that had supernatural abilities were deemed evil. And they were like, they got everyone in this group mindset, this mob mentality, you know, every, uh, all the people that had weak spirits, they felt good coming together and killing people that had powerful spirits out of jealousy. You know what I mean? Out of a sense of, um, a jealous spirit, a covetous spirit. I don't know how else to describe that. And that's satanic. That's evil to me personally. That's my, that's my opinion on that. Now, am I saying all witches were good? No, I'm not. All wizards? All saints? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they were powerful. They had powerful energy. And the world across was on board and cool with, you know, feeding them to lions and stuff. Now, the gladiators, you know, we, we've done more on gladiators. I'm not going to get too much into gladiators, but basically they used to be professional monster killers. And they, they're, they're some of the survivors that have superhero-like abilities. So they're the only ones, or the, they're, they're, they were the best ones suited to destroy predators who were fantasoids or monsters that I just showed you a minute ago, right? So they were hired, eventually, by local townspeople. This is the whole Witcher TV show. They were hired by local townspeople. They were like, oh, I can make a living doing this. This is great because it's easy for me. It's not easy for these common people. And then nobility took notice and they hired their own and they made their armadas and they made their, um, their elite forces and their knights. And, um, that led to gladiators and that led to these people being paid to fight beasts and phantasoids and stuff in the ring. But then their numbers dwindled. And they still needed a job and something to entertain the masses with. So they put regular animals in there and then they put witches in there and saints. And you know what I mean? That's the whole gladiator spiel. Oh, this is interesting. Hold up. So, um, we should be able to find records of the atmosphere being electrically amplified. If we look and there are records just cause it's called the dark ages doesn't mean there's no record of history. Um, my favorite so far has been, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. I don't want that. I'm going to search for, let's see, body. I'm going to search for the word body. Give me a quick second here. I'm going to look up this interesting historic um, entry. Uh, damn, I had it highlighted earlier. Oh, corrupt. It was corrupt. I'm searching certain keywords that I'm remembering here. Corrupt, corrupt, corrupt. Ah, here we go. Is this it? Oh, this is about some guy's hand was uncorrupted. It was this severed hand or whatever. That's not what I'm looking for, but that is a good example. Ah, oh, fudge. Hold on. Um, body. I know it had the word body. Body, body, body. Body. Damn, I can't remember exactly what it was. Hold on. I need to make this smaller. I can read it better. One second. I'm going to find this interesting story. Basically, they found this dead woman's body. Um, but she died like 50 years prior. And her body did not rot. I'm going to see it's, it's right here towards the beginning. Uh, real quick. This is really interesting. I just want to read it. It might take a second. Oh, oops. Hold on. Uh, let's see.
All right, we're over halfway there. Damn, I'm so sorry. I, I totally had this earlier. If I don't find it in a second, I'll just move on. Well, I can't find it. I'll have to search it, through it again. But basically, man, it's like in the year 600 or something. Let me go back to 600. Oh, it's too far. Ah. It's right around this time. 700, 600, somewhere around here. And anyways, they found there, there's this woman's dead body for like, so should be rotting for like 50 something years. Um, this entire thing is very interesting. I do know some things. Let me let's type in wonderful. Wonderful serpents. When anytime you hear about fiery serpents or wonderful serpents, uh, that's plasma in the sky, right? Just like the auroras and stuff like that. They can look like that. Wonderful. This is the year 774. Allegedly. Um, during the Dark Ages. Wonderful serpents were seen in the land of the South Saxons. And all throughout this account, I've shared this many times, uh, people saw the strangest things in the skies. Right? The glory of the Lord. I think it even talks about the glory. Glory of... Let's see if I can find it here. The glory of God. That's basically the auroras stretching across the earth. Um... Yeah, and it talks about there being two moons in this historic record. It talks about beams of light shooting up towards the north that people saw, blue beams of light shooting up into the sky. It talks about um, a cross seen in the moon. There's all kinds of interesting little historic anomalies here. And this is, this, these were uh, historic records of note that were taken in monasteries and collected and people went to all these monasteries and just collected all of them to create an account of history. It's very interesting. It's called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. All right. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, oh, this King Arthur. Yeah. So the whole King Arthur thing, we'll skip that because, you know, we've already kind of mentioned that. Uh, Satan being crushed. We talked about that. I, I talked about that. My video. We started off with the coins and the dates, right? And there's many other examples that I, I didn't have time to share, like the dates in ancient books and maps and things. Here's another example here. And we talked about the phantom time conspiracy. We might be wrapping things up. Let me see. Yes. All right. So we were, that's wrapping things up. I'm not, I'm not going to finish because I have not been in the chat at all this entire time. Now I am. So... If you're still hanging in there with me, there's a lot of people watching. I'm honored. If you're hanging in there and you would like to comment or you have a question or, you know, idea, you want to share your ideas or whatever, uh, let's do it. So Cactus J2K says, Jay Jimmers, it sounds like your timetable corresponds to the 2030, 2050 agendas uh, where everyone must be transhuman or totally controlled. Well, yeah. So that's what I was saying earlier, Cactus J2K, is technology is um it's unnecessary when you live during the the millennial reign when you live during the time where energy is shooting up out of the earth right in places of power and you can just harness it and it goes around you and you're amplified all naturally you don't need technology so to try to put all the technology inside of you and stuff uh to take that with you only means that you're going to be easier to control or plasma possessed um you know what I mean? By other powers, other forces, or even other people. So I'm, I'm not a fan of, you know, transhumanism or, you know, putting microchips into my neck or my brain or anywhere, you know, like I'll use the technology like we are now in small doses or whatever. <clears throat> um, but I look forward to the time when we don't need it at all. And I will also say that it's probably like, remember how I said that the people who worship Satan, the God of the air, they're setting up these towers all around the world. 
and they're they're getting ready to make it because because that negative energy will descend from the sky during the next plasma apocalypse, right? It will be defeated because it'll get trapped in here and all those blue beams will emerge and, you know, far outweigh the, the negative energy that comes down. But they're they're setting up all this stuff, these towers and cables and whatnot, um, so they can manipulate that energy once again. All right, uh, let's see, we got... Coriander's in the chat. Aw, oh, thanks, Coriander. Susan Donahue, appreciate you. Thank you, too. Let's see, anything else? Yes, two moons. Two moons. Uh, I've heard of Indian tales of a time with no moons, but two moons is new for me. Yes, I've, I've heard of a few different occasions where there were two moons, even two suns. Um, and it's happened before, which means it will probably happen again. And I've, and I've actually dreamed about two moons as well. Very vivid dreams. Uh, let's see. Well, it looks like that's about it. So let's see, Jack. Jack uh, Alinsky says, J-Dreamers, so a pharaoh had a pyramid built for their tomb, and yet they were never put in their coffin. Okay, so for me personally, my theory and pretty strong idea about the pyramids is that they're just like the cathedrals, basically. They're just a different type of cathedral or a place of power that was used to lengthen the lifespan and keep, keep the rulers of that country young. And they would have little coffins, which were just little baths, basically. And they would they would open up the caverns below the pyramid, and they would allow that energy to flow through. Now, that's just one thing that they can do with it. There were other caverns and, and other things that, that can be employed. But that's why we often see beams of light depicted as shooting up out of pyramids. You know what I mean? Because light came up through the ground or through the... Um, in in the um, emerald tablets, Hermes, is it Hermes? Uh, Thoth, he describes uh, there being a hall underneath the Great Pyramids. Many of them, I'm sure, all of all of the Great Pyramids around the world, they're built on caves, basically, to allow that energy to come up. Same exact way as the cathedrals that we talked about earlier. All right, let's see. Choo -choo -choo, anything else? Oh, and this is the Great Pyramid, by the way. So, like, you know, this is the center of the world. This is where that idea that the Great Pyramid in Egypt, like, Egypt used to be here, okay? Babylon used to be here. All of the great nations of the world used to be here. So I'm not one that's on board personally, and, and it's, you know, you don't have to agree with me or nothing, but that's not my mentality, is the Great Pyramid in Egypt was the center of the world or whatever. No, that is is the Great Pyramid, right there in the middle at the center of the world, where it should be and where it always has been. Uh, but those other ones are types. You know what I mean? They're definitely types. Oh, we got some people. Okay, sweet. I think everyone was just like, I've been talking for a long time, so you probably weren't ready for me to jump in the chat. What's up, MJ? Good to see you. Uh, Alex, you're super welcome. Stone says, have you heard about the bell tolling like a bell? I think you probably mean the moon ringing like a bell. And yes, I have. And that makes sense to me because the actual real moon, the physical thing that projects the luminary, that's hollow. And it's an inverted dome, I believe, at the top of the firmament. And so, yes, it's hollow and it would definitely ring like a bell. Ariel says, I would love to take... G oh, that's, that's kind. Uh, let's see. Ace Maynard says, what an amazing presentation tonight, Jay. Uh, I'm so proud of all of your growth. Thank you. Mary Cronin says, did you see the orange moon rising tonight? No, I haven't been outside yet. I've been on the computer working. <laughs> I was so tired earlier today, too. Like I, I, As a dad, I had to wake up super early and get my son all ready and stuff. And blah, blah, blah. Woke up way earlier than I wanted to. So I was pretty tired. Uh, how are there some places and times where there are no moons? Oh, good. So the moon that you see up in the sky is just a luminary. Right, it's always been described in the ancient, in the old ways as being a luminary or just a light. 
So that light is cast down upon us. When the energy reverses and it goes up, you, that moon isn't there. Okay, that, there's a time before the moon. There's actually, there's, um, the Pelasgians are the main race of people that come to mind who existed. There's these legends of, the, of a tribe of people called the Pelasgians. And they existed in a time before the moon. And there's many tribes, ancient records of, of tribes and, and people who talk about um, when they were first on the land that there was no moon, that the moon suddenly appeared. Oh, uh, let's see. What year do I think the catastrophe will happen? I have no idea. I'm, I'm, I will never say what year I think it's going to happen because I have no, I honestly don't know what year it'll happen, but I will watch the signs. I promise you that. I will do my research. I will study and I will use my feelings and my senses and my wits and my and my common sense. <laughs> but I watch the signs like a clock. I don't watch the calendar that's all messed up like we just talked about. You have brought us here and we appreciate you. Thank you. I did not bring you here, just so you know. But I, I know what you're saying and I appreciate you. Doctor Who says, Jay, do you feel that we need to know the real current date? I, no, I don't. I don't feel like it. Eh, it's, I don't. I don't care. But I'm not a math person. If you're a math person, you probably do. You probably want to know. Um, but the date is just, dates start and end with apocalyptic cycles. Right? Or cataclysms. That's how, that's, that's what dates are for. You know what I mean? Because I'm sure the entire earth was created far longer, you know, than 2000 years or whatever. So for me, no, it doesn't really, I don't really care. I'm not interested in what's the actual date because it's just a date from a, some, some event, some point in history that people felt was significant, but there's many points in history that are significant. You know what I mean? There has been many, many dates and stuff, but that's, that's like a personal thing. It's up to you. Uh, Cactus J2K says, I've been having vivid dreams of two moons. Interesting. Right on. Uh, what else we got here? MJ, how come there are times when there is no sun or moon? Uh, I, I, I think it's just has to do with, um, the conditions that we go through energetically in our world. Right. And it's hard for me to describe that because I'm not sure what your cosmology is. But for me, my cosmology makes it easy to manipulate the sun and the moon. It makes it easy for the earth to change and make the sun disappear, the moon disappear, reappear, multiple suns, multiple moons, etc. Um, and I've found many references and stories to all of those throughout history. Personally, uh, Stony, what's up? Says J Dreamers on the Mercator map. The Euphrates looks like it's between Alaska and Russia. And would the sun heading north evaporating the northern waters? Yes, definitely. So the sun will. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. So I don't. I don't think the sun will completely evaporate them. It might though. You you have something. You got a good point there. It could. I could see that. Sure. Uh, they will also. If there is any water there, when the depressurization comes, it'll get sucked up in the sky. But I like where you're thinking about the sun being so hot that it starts evaporating those waters. That's that's actually a good point. Uh, let's see. I'll rest when I'm ashes. So is the safe zone Alaska? Nope. Jack Alinsky says, J-Dreamers, it was a joke. Okay, right on. Sorry. It's hard for me to tell what's a joke in the chat sometimes. Jay Dreamers for the perspective. You're super welcome. Mar says, do you think that things will start to happen this year? No, I think things have been happening. I think things have been happening for quite some time. And they're amplifying. And I think we're getting closer. If that's what you're asking me, yes, I think we're getting much closer. Uh, let's see. So how did the moon get there? Uh, it's just a projection. So it's just being projected. Um, I don't know how to explain it in like a short form that would save us time right now. So I will refer you to my, let's see, is it, I think it's my, there's a, there's one called shoot the moon that I did. I think you should check that one out because I totally explain all of the stuff about the moon and where it comes from and all that stuff. 
but that requires a lot of time at the moment, which I don't have. Sorry. But just remember, it's just a light in the sky. Like you could turn on and turn off super quick. Um, and it grows in size and stuff. But I definitely don't. My I don't have a an academic mindset or a mindset of belief systems from a cod. Um, no, any longer. I used to. I don't any longer. I haven't for quite some time. Um, in academics, they believe the moon is like a rock and they, even they can't explain where it came from. You know what I mean? The ancient cosmologies easily explain what the moon is, why it acts strange from time to time, its cycles, its paths, its description, what it looks like. It's, it's, um, you know, what it looks like in the sky or whatever, its color. I mean, it all makes sense when, when you have a different cosmology or a different way of thinking. United AUS protest says, J. Jimmers, I watched the sunset behind a hill at the same time to the east rays of light were rising from the horizon. Strange times. Yes, I agree. It is strange times. You're welcome. Jack says, my favorite lie is that they helped move blocks of stone with ancient rope. Okay. I mean, I, I it's pretty easy to move blocks of stones with rope. So <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, what else we got here? Uh, MJ, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Is that why we have different moon phases? I'm not sure what that refers to. I'm not keeping a record of our prior conversations in my head because I have to like, remember what everybody's saying and stuff like that. And I'm, I got stuff here in real life that's distracting me, like on my computer, there's different things up here and stuff. So you'll have to be, I'm asking for you to be a little more specific and like, just kind of start over with our conversation each time. Um, why do we have different moon phases? Uh, that all, it all has to do, you'll have to check out my moon video, right? Because it has, there's an inverted dome at the top of our firmament and the light from outside of the firmament swirls around and it passes around and it, and it affects the projections of that light into our world, right? And they all follow the same patterns and stuff like that. Um, so yes, that would be why we have different moon phases. Gemini says, Jay, thank you so much for sharing your insight. I want to know how the positive people can find each other during the apocalypse. I think you'll naturally find each other. Um, after the apocalypse, the wise go to the light. So, um, if you, the biggest beam of bright light that you see, if you go to a high place, if there is a high place and you look around Wherever you see that biggest, tallest beam of bright light is likely going to be today's North Pole. It will, it will, after, after the apocalypse, it'll actually be the South Pole. Technically, magnetically speaking, it'll be South. Um, but that's where I'm going. <laughs> and that's where I'm sure a lot of other people will go. But there will also be smaller little poles, you know, in other places of power that shoot up and stuff. And, you know, people will gather around them and they'll, um, They'll settle down and that will be called a polis or a strong pole, a polos, which will be a city, right? And there'll be a circumference around those poles, which is a circumference of light and energy um, and how that pole affects people, right? Like how we talked about regeneration and stuff. And that circumference will be the metropolis. It will be the, the measurement of the circumference around that pole. And then others who live on, you know, the outer darker areas on the outskirts or the fringe of that circumference or that metropolis or metro metropolis, right? Um, they will live on the subsection or the skirts of that circle or that orb. So they will be the sub orbians and that will be the sub orbs or the suburbs. What else we got? I think that's, oh, wait, no, my chat glitched here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up tonight. I've had a great time and I'm honored to have so many people watching for so long tonight. If you, if, if you feel like, you know, today's presentation was valuable, I plan on making more like this. And one of my friends recommended that I do some pre-recorded, edited videos and stuff too. So I may do that too. Um, but if you want to share, that would be helpful to me. 
I don't normally ask people to do that. Mm, and I'm not really asking you to. I'm just saying, if you want to help out, you know, if you want to support me without like, you know, being members or super chats and stuff like that, um, spreading the word about my channel is super helpful. So if you'd like to, I just thank you in advance. All right. Until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye. Oh